up and do that as you're ready. We are in our last message of our series on the cloud of witnesses. We're inspired a lot by uh, Hebrews 12 that says, when we look to those who have gone before us, we can persevere through times of trial, through times of struggle, and all that goes with that. We've walked from the third century or in the second century in Amis and Cletica, all the way through to John Wesley and Oscar Romero, James Cohn, Julian of Norwich, and today uh, we move into Claire of Assisi to end our time. Uh, but first, a little humble pie. I think two weeks ago I claimed that St. Francis visited Julian of Norwich. I was wrong. Uh, the Archbishop of Can Canterbury, John Wycliffe, and Marjorie Kemp did, but I made up that other fact, so please forgive me. Uh, and in a second acknowledgement of more humility, it was not until writing this sermon that I found out that Claire of Assisi was not St. Francis's sister. So if you are like me and thought, well, Francis of Assisi, Claire of Assisi, they started orders together, they must have been related, you also are wrong. Um, Claire of Assisi, uh, born in Italy, in Assisi, believe it or not, in 1194-ish, everything in that period, especially with women, is ish, unfortunately. But Claire uh, grew up in a wealthy household down the road from Francis's order. Francis was alive at the time and became a huge fan of him. They're, con they're often called one another like soul lovers. They were connected at a soul level in their visions for one another. They saw one another as counterparts in what they were doing. And Claire started her own monastery and order, religious order, in conversation with the Franciscans. The Franciscans were intense. Kind of the big religious order of the day was the Benedictines. They're the first big religious order. And the Benedictines, my spiritual director is... Oh, buddy. That was a bad one. Yeah. Hmm. Fortunately, all the Holland boys take the hits well. Noah has a dent on his head from a fall a few weeks ago, but I think it's permanent. Um, I know. I'm a bad parent. Anyway, the, the Benedictines were a radical and beautiful order. The rule of St. Benedict has informed many, many orders. My spiritual director is Benedictine, so everything I'm about to say, I mean well. Over the centuries, they accrued enormous amounts of wealth and power uh, and enormous amounts of prestige in the papacy and able to, like, wield that prestige. I would argue often to call the church towards beautiful things, but they just had an enormous amount of power. Francis saw this power and felt that it was uh, getting in the way of truly following Jesus. And so he fought uh, to found his own order based on simplicity and poverty and engagement with nature and reliance on nature and not the systems we build around themselves. Uh, he was, in fact, so successful in embedding this message, or unsuccessful, when he died, the order divided over whether they were allowed to own books. That was the only thing. They were like, well, we can't own anything else, but surely books are okay. And they divided it over. Claire, seeing this movement and, and compelled and emboldened by it, fought to create what she called the Order of Poor Ladies uh, and to have the same level of vows of poverty that the Franciscans had. The Vatican initially pushed back and said, you should follow Benedict's rule. It's much more bearable, much more... Uh, balanced. It's much less extreme. And Claire fought tooth and nail with Pope Innocent until he agreed and allowed her to have the same austerity measures as the Order of St. Francis, the Franciscans. She is the first woman to write a rule of life for a religious order. These are radically incredible things for her time and really for any time. We don't have a lot of people writing the rules of life for their religious orders, let alone women, let alone in the 1100s. Um, she was massively influential across the whole of the church. In fact, within two days of her death, they had started the canonization process to make her a saint. It's about as early as you can possibly get. The Pope changed the orders of how they did the funeral so that she could be sainted faster. It was seen that Claire was doing something radical, and they took notice of it. But she was not just worthy of their considerations, the things she did not, said did not just apply to them. I think they have something to teach us today. But before we dive into what she said, I want to put up our framing passage. We're in Matthew 6. This is the message paraphrase, but I just really like the way he says it. 
Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile, whoop, treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. Hmm? Isn't it obvious? It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place where you most want to be and end up being. St. Clair says it this way. We become what we love, and who we love shapes what we become. If we love things, we become a thing. If we love nothing, we become nothing. Imitation is not a literal mimicking of Christ. Rather, it means becoming the image of the beloved, an image disclosed through transformation. This means we are to become vessels of God's compassionate love for others. Where we most want to be is where we end up being. We become what we love, and who we love shapes us. This is one of those messages that hopefully has the power to kind of reach down into our soul, into our heart, into our calendars and our agendas, into our pocketbooks and into our budgets, and reorient everything in a new and compelling way. But this is also one of those messages that often ends in kind of shame and shoulding on ourselves. You should love better things. You shouldn't care about money. You should feel bad about X, Y, or Z. And what I love about Claire is rather than lean into where it often ends, she provides the path out rather than on dwelling on the consequences of the thing. Yes, if we love things, we become a thing. But the way out of this is not anything other than to just love better the things we want to be to love our God more fully, to love our neighbors more fully, and to love ourselves more fully. When we do those three things, we become more who we are called to be, who we are made to be. We become the image of God within us in, an un, in a revealed, compelling, and beautiful way. It is so easy to start with like, don't think about purple elephants, and then all of us envision a purple elephant. This is often the church's approach to how to be better Christians. Sinless. Oh, okay. Which one? You know, like, can I still drink coffee? Um, but the reality of what she calls us to is just learn to love the things that represent who you want to be. And we can all learn to love things. Almost everyone in here learned to love coffee because no one likes coffee at the first sip. And an even better example is kale. The fact that you can even sell kale is proof that we have learned to love things because it is terrible and it is an awful, awful, awful plant. Um, <laughs> you've heard it here first. Hot takes. Matt hates kale. But I've learned to love it because Becca showed me if you put enough butter and salt on anything, it's delicious. <laughs> Here's the reality. We get to be people that say, who do I want to be? Who do I want to become? Let me put that in front of myself and love it. And who I want to become is more who God made me to be. So I actually have to start a little bit with loving myself, which is much less comfortable for me than like loving strangers. And then like loving my family and loving my friends and loving my partner and loving my children there's all the, like, the base love of, like, well, obviously I love them. But then there's that other love that is hard. Loving those that are across the street from us that look different, that think different, that overwhelm who we are, all of the realities of that. We are called to something more, and we are given the path towards it. Martin Buber is a uh, 20th century Jewish philosopher. He wrote this seminal book called I and Thou. There's a lot of books written by Jewish philosophers after the Holocaust saying, how did this happen? How can humans do this to humans? And, and there are a number of scholars that have compelling answers. I love Buber's the most. Buber says, humans are created to be an I-thou relationship with one another, a me and a you. But what we do more often than not is create a me and an it relationship. And it's really easy to do. Watch, I am the pastor, you are a congregation. I am a man, some of you are women. I am five foot ten, some of you are not that high. Like, it's easy to do this, and we do this all over the place. I am a Republican, or I am a Democrat, and you are the opposite. I'm a Libertarian, or I listen to Spotify, and you listen to Apple Music. All sorts of places we qualify that we categorize ourselves 
to remove the image of godness in one another. And as soon as we've made someone an it, not only do we choose not to love them, but we avail ourselves the opportunities to do violence to them. And so Buber says, strive to see everyone as you, as made in the image of God. And I would say it this way, I am not a pastor. Hi, kiddo. You want to stand with me? I'm not a pastor and you a congregation. I am a human made in the image of God tasked with serving a congregation. And you are humans made in the image of God tasked with serving a congregation. I am a person who votes in a party. You are a person made in the image of God who might vote for a different party. I am a person who spends money on X, Y, or Z, and you are a person who spends money on X, Y, or Z also made in the image of God. You can just put you made in the image of God are this thing that is different than me, and you de-it them. And when we de-it someone, we can love them in a real way that, according to St. Clair, also helps us to become love. Compassionate love to others, she says, is the way this works out. When we love radically and we see that people are deserving of love regardless of who we might have itted them in being in the past, it is incredible how it transforms us. Bye, kiddo. And you're going to stay up here and probably pull on a cord. Good luck, Jesse. Um, the reality is, and what I love about Claire is she even speaks to the ways that sometimes we do it. Well, I just won't love anything because that could be the temptation. Like, we go to the extreme ascetic. This is a woman who owned zero things, to be clear. But she says, if you love nothing, you become nothing. This message echoes through the ways that we might choose something short of what we are called to. It's not avoid relationship. It's love people. It's not avoid challenging people. It's love people. It's not avoid self-care for the sake of love. It's love yourself. It's not try to do this in and of yourself. It's love the God of the universe who made you to love. When we do these things, when we step in these realities, we get made new into something beautiful. We become what we love. I want to read this quote one more time for us. We become what we love and who we love shapes what we become. We become what we love, and who we love shapes what we become. If we love things, we become a thing. If we love nothing, we become nothing. Imitation is not the literal mimicking of Christ. Rather, it means becoming the image of the beloved, an image disclosed through transformation. This means we are to become vessels of God's compassionate love for others. I want to close in this thought. That last thing she says there, imitation is not the literal mimicking of Christ. Church, this calls us to something much harder than most of us want to admit to. Because it's really easy to say, well, I'll just read my Bible and do what Jesus did. So I'm like constantly stepping into crowds and writing on the ground all the time. No, no, all right, we got some, some New Testament people in the room. The call isn't actually to just literally do what Jesus does. The call is to incarnate Jesus today in our world, in our context, in our place. Because Jesus was writing and speaking and being in a literal context, in a time, in a place with specific humans. And he was a pastor before he was a theologian. And the same is true for each and every one of us. We are called to figure out what Jesus is incarnating in us today and do that thing. For teachers, that probably looks different than for carpenters, and that probably looks different than for accountants or whatever else it might be. Are you coming back up? I was gone all this week, so Noah likes me again, and it's wonderful. Um, but there's this call to us to just do the work, and this is hard work, but to do the work of what Jesus actually wants us to do today. And again, I think Claire's answer is, look at the things you want to be like and love those things. Love the people that you want to be like. I think it's okay to become fans of humans who are doing life in a way that you want to do life. And loving those humans, learning about them, studying about them, 
mom left so you're confused. Oh, you want the microphone? No, you can't have the microphone. Um, there is a call to us in something greater. <gasps> Look, a piggy bank. Go to mommy. Go to mommy. Go to mommy. I like that Noah keeps coming up here in this message because our kids have a lot to teach us. Like, they haven't learned that it's embarrassing to say how you feel. Like, they haven't learned that you can't cry whenever you feel like crying. They haven't learned all of the lies that we have been sold. Noah loves radically. Emmett loves radically. Our children can teach us a lot. I want to know who I'm made to be. I've got to love the little ones. Church, we can be a people that are remade just by renaming what it is we want to love and trusting that in loving that thing, that being, that God, that ourselves, that everything will change slowly, but everything will change. Let's pray. <sighs> Jesus, help us to love you and our neighbors and ourselves more than we love stuff, fame, Instagram likes, prestige, power, clothes, whatever it might be. May we love you and all that you have created as good in a way that makes us whole. Help us to become who you made us to be by loving those who you made in love. In your holy and mighty name, amen.